White to Gas the Sea was written by Jean Rise in 1966, a novel she wrote as an answer to Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. Jean Rise was born Ella Gwendolyn Rees Williams in the Caribbean island of Dominica and resided in England from the age of 16. Her father was a Welsh doctor, her mother was a third generation Creole, and had a life that included pursuing chorus lines, prostitution, alcoholism, destitution, and a series of men who later abandoned her, expansions that are evident throughout the novel. The protagonist of White Sargasso Sea is Rise's version of Rochester's foreign wife, Bertha, who lives a life portrayed by Bronte, characterized simply as the mad ghost in the attic. The story takes place before Antoinette arrives in England and instead begins with her childhood and youth in Calibri, Jamaica, shortly after slavery has been abolished in the British Empire following the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833. Antoinette lives with her mother, Annette Causeway, and her brother Pierre after her father, a previously wealthy plantation owner, passed away. The society that Antoinette's childhood takes place in is deeply divisive, and she and her family are despised due to their previous status as slave owners and their poor state. The novel takes on a unique literary technique where it is divided into three parts that alternate in perspective. Part 1, which describes Antoinette's life up to her being sent away to a convent, is told from her perspective. Part 2 begins with Antoinette and the unnamed Rochester in their newlywed lives, and is told primarily from Rochester's perspective with the exception of one section that is told from Antoinette's point of view. Part 3 culminates with Antoinette's narrative, which has grown increasingly disjointed up to this point, as Antoinette sets Rochester's estate on fire and walks into the flames, committing arson and suicide. Weizsäcker's Sea deals with several themes of oppressive patriarchal power, imperialism, and displaced identities where the characters of the novel play both the oppressors and the oppressed. In this lecture series, we focus primarily on two topics, imperialism and colonialism, as well as identity and culture and their roles in the novel Weizsäcker's Sea. The actions of Rochester in Wide Sargasso Sea can also be seen to mirror the subjugation of colonial subjects by imperial powers. When describing the Caribbean landscape and the wedding, Rochester uses extreme imagery, such as everything is too much, too much blue, too much purple, too much green, the flowers too red, the mountains too high, the hills too near. And with regard to the wedding, he says, it was all brightly colored, very strange, but it meant nothing to me, nor did she, the girl I was to marry. When at last I met her, I bowed, smiled, kissed her hand, danced with her. I played the part I was expected to play. She never had anything to do with me at all. These extracts really demonstrate the sense of alienation from his surroundings that Rochester experiences. He doesn't really see the Caribbean or its people for who they are. He sees them more as a setting for his own existence. Additionally, he has a very business-like relationship with the landscape and Antoinette. This can be seen as a metaphor for the business-like relationship of imperial powers exploiting colonies for material gain. There is also similar imagery earlier in the novel in Antoinette's from, Antoin from Antoinette's perspective. She says of the fire, I would never see Calibri again. Nothing would be left, the golden ferns and the silver ferns, the orchids, the ginger lilies and the roses, the rocking chairs on the blue sofa, the jasmine in the honeysuckle, and the picture of the miller's daughter. When they had finished, there would be nothing left but blackened walls and the mounting stone. The positive imagery in this passage can be seen to represent the state of the Caribbean before colonialism and imperial domination, while the destructed, yeah, the images of the destroyed plantation can be seen as representative of the destructive nature of imperialism and the transformative power it had in the Caribbean. In that passage, Antoinette's also looking back at Cleavery in a much more fond and personal way than the way that Rochester sees the landscape and the occupants of the Caribbean. Later at Grand Bois, books over Rochester's desks include Byron's poems and novels by Sir Walter Scott, both of whom wrote about and glorified imperial conquest. Additionally, in Jane Eyre, when Rochester is a recounting his version of the honeymoon events to Jane, he says that he was considering suicide because of Antoinette's behavior until, quote, a wind fresh from Europe blew over the oceans and the air grew pure. So even in Jane Eyre, Europe is seen as a solution to the problem of the wild, untamed Caribbean.
Rochester's literal and metaphorical ownership of Antoinette is also emphasized in Wine Pegasus C. In part two, he says, I have not bought her, she has bought me, or so she thinks. Even though Rochester is the one who is technically bought via the dowry, he is still receiving Antoinette almost as property. Of the dowry, he says, the 30,000 pounds have been paid to me without question or condition, no provision made for her that must be seen to. This really emphasizes how Rochester only sees Antoinette in terms of her dowry and her potential for economic exploitation, similarly to how colonies and their inhabitants were only seen in the same way, without any regard for the actual humanity of their inhabitants. Later in the novel, Christophine and Antoinette discuss Antoinette's situation. Christophine suggests that Antoinette take money and run away. Antoinette replies, And you, that is to say Christophine, must understand that I am not rich now. I have no money of my own at all. Everything I had belongs to him. This is in reference to English property law, where upon marriage, all of a woman's property was immediately and permanently transferred to her husband. But this can also be seen as a metaphor for how in colonized lands, Everything is seized and taken by the colonizer for their own benefit, leaving the original inhabitants with nothing. Names are a very important part of both Wine Sargasso Sea and colonial domination. Under imperialism, renaming lands and their inhabitants emphasize the imbalanced power dynamic inherent to colonialism. In Wine Sargasso Sea, Antoinette's struggle to reclaim her identity is underlined throughout the text. In part one, when she is signing a piece of embroidery in school, she says, I will write my name in fire red, Antoinette Mason, nay Causeway. Her inclusion of her original surname is representative of how Antoinette is working to not surrender her previous identity to the domination of Mason, who has come over from Europe to marry her mother. Later, in part two, Rochester begins to call Antoinette by the name Bertha, after finding out that Antoinette's mother's full name was also Antoinette, and that she was considered mad. While initially, Antoinette would usually resist, she would eventually give in in most cases, saying things such as, it doesn't matter, and as you wish, regard to, with regards to what he called her. Renaming can be seen as a violent colonial act. Rochester attempts to transform Antoinette into someone and something she is not, in order to better fit his European sensibilities. In Wine Sargasso Sea, Rochester himself is never actually mentioned by name. In Three Women's Texts and a Critique of Imperialism, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak argues that Rochester lacks the power of the name, and he only has the ability to name other things, such as Antoinette. Loss of, the, uh, loss of his name can be seen in another book on the bookshelves in Grand Bois, entitled Life and Letters of, with the rest of the title worn away. The loss of the patronymic in this book title can be seen as representative of Rochester's lack of a name in the novel. The concept of othering is central to Spivak's analysis. Othering can be defined as the process by which people or things become classified as inherently different or alien. Spivak argues that Bertha's function in Jane Eyre is to be seen as more animal than human and thus weaken her entitlement to protection under the law. This can be seen as a reflection of the way that native populations were seen as subhuman by colonizers. Risk works to reclaim Antoinette's humanity in part three by noting that her attack on her brother was triggered by the use of the phrase, I cannot interfere legally. This emphasizes Antoinette's lucidity as opposed to the way that she is posited as a senseless madwoman in Jane Eyre. 
In a letter written to Rochester, warning him about Antoinette, it is said that soon the madness in Antoinette and in all these white Creoles come out. By appealing to the belief that the Caribbean climate made white people go mad, the letter aids in the othering of Antoinette by further divorcing her from her European background. When Rochester stops seeing Antoinette as European, it becomes easily it becomes easier for him to dominate her. Antoinette is other to the point that when she looks at herself in a mirror at the end of the novel, she finds herself unrecognizable. She then lights Thornfield Hall on fire and leaps from the roof to her death. I would like to close this particularly powerful passage from Spivak's essay. Riss makes Antoinette see herself as her other, Bronte's Bertha. In the last section of Why Sargasso Sea, Antoinette acts out Jane Eyre's conclusion and recognizes herself as the so-called ghost in Thornfield Hall. I went into the hall again with the tall candle in my hand. It was then that I saw her, the ghost, the woman with streaming hair. She was surrounded by a gilt frame, but I knew her. The gilt frame encloses a mirror, which reflects the othered self. It is now at the very end of the book that Antoinette slash Bertha can say, now at last I know why I was brought here and what I have to do. We can read this as her having been brought into the England of Bronte's novel. This cardboard house, a book between cardboard covers, where I walk at night, is not England. In this fictive England, she must play out her role, act out the transformation of herself into the fictive other, set fire to the house and kill herself, so that Jane Eyre can become the feminist individualist heroine of British fiction. I must read this as an allegory of the general epistemic violence of imperialism, the construction of a self-immolating colonial subject for the glorification of the social mission of the colonizer. A crucial element of both the imperialism and Rochester's imperialistic parallels in Wide Sargasso Sea is the psychology behind it, um, and that's a psychology from both Antoinette and Rochester. And surprisingly, even though they respond very differently to it, they had very similar upbringings in terms of how they were viewed by their parents. Uh, Annette, Antoinette was classically conditioned by Annette to feel inferior, and part of that was because of her gender. Annette strongly favored Antoinette's brother, and Rochester was the youngest son. He didn't really have a purpose. He wasn't trained to do anything important. His job was to marry a very rich woman and not taint the family name. So both Antoinette and Rochester were looked down upon by their parents. Uh, and with Antoinette, it was especially difficult because she was different from the inhabitants of her surroundings. Her identity was economically based. And so once she lost that, there was nothing else to build it upon. And then Antoinette rarely decided who she was. She was talked about by Mason, Tia, or other slaves. She was talked about in the letter Sandy wrote to Rochester about her alleged psychosis, and Antoinette was made to believe she was crazy. So when she did marry Rochester, that was how he viewed her. His affection for her was never real. It was based on her potential as a source of wealth. But that's what Antoinette was used to. That's how she grew up. So any affection she saw wasn't genuine, yet she was unable to differentiate. And in a culture that Rochester grew up in, where your potential value as a monetary asset was greater than your merit as a human being, he didn't know how to give affection that wasn't based on that. So as Rochester stripped Antoinette of her identity, she came to realize that much of it was built on where she came from geographically, uh, such as with the red dress that she wears when she's originally in the attic, when she says, the scent that came from the dress was very faint at first, then it grew stronger. The smell of cinnamon and dust and lime trees when they are flowering, the smell of the sun and the smell of the rain. And she realized that though she had been stripped of much of her identity, trying to assimilate into European English culture was proving that where she came from was truly her home. And Rochester was able to dominate not just because of English property laws, which did make Antoinette the property of her husband, but because Antoinette did not realize that she had the means to resist him until part three, uh, in which suicide was kind of her final demonstration of resistance. It was only death that could actually free her because it was the one thing that Rochester could not control. <laughs>
Madness in Weizsäcker's safe functions as an intrinsic part of its woman's identities. The story follows Antoinette's descent into madness, a path whose steps are already hauled out for her by her own mother, Annette, who had passed away while she was in convent school. As opposed to her portrayal in Jane Eyre, however, Rise's version of the madwoman in the closet gives voice and context to her previously mute character. In this discussion of madness and identity, an important distinction must be made between madness and insanity. Antoinette, also known as Bertha, is portrayed by Bronte as a woman with a deranged mind, or as being insane. In Wise Regards to See, however, the madness that manifested in Antoinette and her mother is best described by Michel Foucault as an invested disease and therefore disease of our civilization. Madness in Wise Regards to See serves as a destabilizing force. While society has built the walls of mental institutions to keep apart the inside and the outside of a culture, to separate between reason and unreason, madness dissolves this boundary and blurs this distinction. Webener, following Foucault's and Feldman's ideas of madness, argues that madness is a metaphor taken to the extreme. Metaphors we have all learned from our freshman English classes is to attribute one thing in terms of another. For example, in the well-known metaphorical saying, all the world's a stage, we are linking together the experience of being on a stage to the world in order to characterize human beings as performers who are playing their allotted roles in the universe. However, when the boundary between things disappears altogether, leaving no coherent essences in plane, we are left with madness. In Wise Gas of Sea, Antoinette's madness is a social phenomenon that is driven by the connection between her own apparent identity and the society she is surrounded by. Antoinette, throughout the novel, clearly struggles with her identity. She is a creole, poor white woman whose father was a slave owner and is consequently an outsider who is detested by all who know her family in Jamaica. She laments, I often wonder who I am and where is my country and where do I belong and why was I ever born at all. Later, as she visits Christophine, she reassures herself and answers her previous questions of belonging that those islands are where she belongs and where she should stay. Her only source of true self-identification is from her home, and she understands herself in terms of both her mother's house and the broader portion of the island in which she has grown up and where she has interacted with those close to her. Antoinette feels an urgent need to identify herself with her surroundings. After Calivary Estate is burned to the ground by what Mr. Mason calls angry drunken Negroes, Antoinette mourns her mother and says she was a part of Calivary that had gone, so she had gone. I was certain of it. Antoinette, like Annette, sees a connection between herself and her home that is further illustrated when she is sent away to a convent school, and she feels the urge to stitch and write her name in fire red. Antoinette Mason, née Causeway, Mount Calvary Convent, Spanish Town, Jamaica, 1839. Her signature not only includes her name, but the story of her differing patriarchal lives in her home, written in the color that had engulfed her family home earlier in the novel. The metaphor that had been previously described by Feldman is one between Antoinette's identity and her home. However, as her relations with the places and the people around her is fragmented and destroyed as her house is burned down, her mother is sent away and eventually passes, and others close to her travel to other countries, her sanity becomes greatly affected. The ultimate separation between Antoinette and her home, which subsequently marks her complete descent into madness, occurs when Rochester takes her away and locks her in an attic in England. Her narrative at this time is increasingly disjointed and includes snippets of memories from calibri and out-of-body experiences. She dreams that she is walking around Rochester's house in England and burns it down, thus completing her alienation in Part 3 of Wides or Gas's Sea. She dreams that she sees herself in a reflection but does not recognize herself, and as the narrative continues, it becomes quite clear that she no longer associates herself with her body. The culmination of her madness arises she makes one last attempt to reunite herself with her home, and consequently her identity, as she awakens from her dream and reenacts the steps of the Colibri fire. In writing White Sargasso Sea, Jean Riss makes a significant historical shift by setting the time period of her novel to the 1830s. In contrast, the events of Jane Eyre, which supposedly happened after the events of White Sargasso Sea, take place in the first decade of the 1800s. Jean Race's purpose of writing White Sargasso Sea was to allow the reader to sympathize with Rochester's mad wife, who is never fully understood in Jane Eyre. By moving the time period of White Sargasso Sea forward to just after the Emancipation Act of 1833, Riss accomplished this by portraying Antoinette's identity as a mad woman in Jane Eyre as a product of her time. Susan R. Page and Jolly writes that, by setting her novel after the passage of the Emancipation Act of 1833, Riss allows racial tensions to come to a head. Caught right in the middle of these racial tensions is Antoinette, who, as a Creole, isn't able to identify with either the whites or the blacks. At that time, newly free blacks hated their formal Creole slave owners. Whites from Europe still associated Creoles with slavery, which had already been considered immoral in England for some time. In the beginning of the novel, Antoinette notes that we were not in the white people's ranks. The Jamaican ladies had never approved of my mother. 
She carries this identity crisis with her throughout the rest of the novel, and it causes her to become rejected by everyone she meets. This chain of betrayal starts with her mother, then her best friend Tia. By the time Antoinette marries Rochester, the only thing she really wants is for someone to finally accept her. However, Rochester was already suspicious of her. He says, I watched her critically. Long, sad, dark, alien eyes. Creole of pure English descent she may be, but they are not English or European either. Despite Antoinette being European by blood, he can't really relate to Antoinette because of the cultural differences resulting from Antoinette growing up in the Caribbean. Antoinette's madness is a product of others being unable to connect with her because of racial tensions. Looking at Antoinette's madness from this context, it's difficult to fault her after experiencing what she went through. Jean makes it easy to understand how a person in her circumstance could slowly descend into madness. However, because of the historical shift that Jean Riss makes, it's questionable whether we can actually even consider the novel a prequel to Jane Eyre. Caitlin Gangle writes that, So sharp was Riss's revision of Bronte's text that at times she wondered if she should detach her story from Jane Eyre entirely. This change in time period was intended to allow Riss to do justice to the character of the madwoman Jane Eyre. However, while Wired Sargassus explains what causes Antoinette to descend into madness, it doesn't actually explain how the character Bertha and Jane Eyre did so. Antoinette and Bertha grew up in significantly different time periods, so the circumstances surrounding them would have been way different. Due to the significance of the difference of setting, Bertha and Antoinette should not be considered the same person. The most we can say is that Antoinette was inspired by the character Bertha. Because of that, Wired Sargassus shouldn't be seen as a reimagining of Jane Eyre rather than a true prequel. John Riss led quite an eventful life, one almost as hectic as that of her heroine Antoinette. Riss was born to a Welsh father and a Creole mother. Even growing up, Riss was part of an outnumbered population of Creoles in Dominica and never felt like she truly fit in, as the Creoles were not considered white nor black. This struggle of dealing with racial identity is one prominent throughout the entire novel of White Sargasso Sea, reminating within Antoinette. This was not the only dilemma with identity that Riss faced that inspired the passage of Antoinette's story. Aside from being white-skinned, yet not English, and from the West Indies, yet not black, cultural juxtapositions were present as well. She was raised being taught English customs, culture, and manners, yet was always exposed to the reality of the West Indies. She felt a part of the West Indian atmosphere, people, and culture, yet knew that her views and the way people viewed her were distorted because of her English upbringing. She never endingly had to fight with the ambiguous feelings of being both an insider and an outsider. Many characters in this novel were based on people in Riss's life. Her grandfather, constantly hopping from one mistress to the next, and his widow were the basis of Causeways and Annette's characters. Christophine was loosely based on Riss's black nurse, Meta, who told her stories of zombies and the dead, bringing about a sense of both love and fear towards black people. Her attitude towards black people was also formed by her envy for them. As she told the Observer Color magazine in 1969, they used to go to dances every night, and they had lovely dresses, high-waisted with a belt to tuck the train through. They used to line the train with paper so it rustled, and wore gorgeous turbans. When they went to Mass, we used to peer through the windows to see them. Additionally, Russ's great-grandfather was a slave owner on a Dominican sugar plant and had his house looted and burned following the Emancipation Proclamation, quite similar to the incident Antoinette faced in the beginning of the novel. Although a post-colonial novel written as a prequel to Jane Eyre, White Sargasso Sea was heavily influenced by the feminism and cultural identity struggles John Riss had to endure throughout her entire life. As Lewis James praised Riss, Although John Riss is not a self-conscious political writer, few novelists have made a more effective exposure of sexist exploitation. Few, if any, have revealed the way in which economic and social dependence undermine a woman's psychic being.